Welcome to Releasing Your Inner Dragon, where story creators talk story creation. Drake is an award-winning fantasy novelist and creative writing teacher. You can find his epic fantasy series, The Genesis Oblivion, on Kindle Vela. Marie runs a fantasy world-building channel called Just In Time World, and her first book, The Hidden Blade, is available on Kindle Unlimited. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome once again to Releasing Your Inner Dragon podcast with Drake and Marie. I am Drake, that is Marie, and we have our very first guest, Connor Crenshaw, is joining us today. He is, uh, I've talked about the fact that I'm writing a 20 novel series with four other writers, or three other writers, there's four of us writing on it, and Connor is one of those writers. So I'm excited to have him on board for this kind of special episode. We're going to do something very, very different. We are going to edit. We're going to go through a piece of work. It's actually something of Marie's. It's an older version, an unedited or less edited version of a, of a very old draft of The Hidden Blade. We're going to go through about a thousand words. We're going to, we're going to line edit. And so I want to kind of start by saying what that means. We only do a thousand words. And because that's about all the time we have, we spend 30 to 45 minutes on every single piece. And it takes about 10 to 12 minutes to read a thousand words. And then we discuss it for 15, 20, 30 minutes and go over things as a group. And so we're going to kind of do that same thing here with these, with these little sessions. And we're going to try to do these often, maybe once a month, maybe a little less. Uh, we're going to ask you guys, we're going to start with this one where we're going to go through something of Marie's, but you guys need to go ahead and send us stuff, releasing your inner dragon at gmail.com. You're going to send us, you know, whatever. And if we pick your stuff, we'll go through it. Just, you know, we won't use your name or anything like that. We'll see who's brave enough to actually send us stuff to go through. And so we've, we've asked Connor to join us because he's also one of my cohorts. He's in all my writers groups and kind of my left-hand man and just a brilliant, brilliant writer and editor himself. And so we've asked him to come on. Do you want to say a few things, Connor, before we start? Uh, I really appreciate Drake, you inviting me. You, you too, Marie. This is a this is something that I'm super passionate about. Um, you know, our critique groups, as Drake mentioned, it's focused on so much, and we go through so much to help other writers. But you know, these critique groups help me. I think more than anybody else. I love reading other people's work. I I love getting my own work critiqued. So this is super exciting. Thank you again for allowing me to join. So I tell everybody all the time, and I say this in all my classes, if you're not in a writer's group, a critiquing writer's group, you're not a writer, you're a typist, because you cannot grow if you're not doing two things. As a writer, you have to do these two things to grow, period. You have to, one, get other people to critique your work. You have to have someone who doesn't care about you kick you in the teeth and show you what you're doing wrong and why it's wrong. But the second thing is you have to critique other people. If you're not critiquing other people, you will not grow. You can send us a random thousand words. It doesn't have to be your first chapter or anything. Just any piece of work that's around a thousand words or less. I have to train my writers groups this. Because they're always like, oh, well, I've got to bring a whole piece. So I guess I have to cut it down a little bit. Or, oh, you got to understand this other stuff. No. What we're doing, so there's there's three types of editors. The first is called a proof editor, and everyone needs a proof editor, everyone. Every single writer in the entire universe, me, you, everyone needs a, a proof editor because there's no way one person can catch every punctuation mistake, every typo, every little you know nuance of everything in a massive manuscript. You need a proof editor, and they're cheap. They're usually three, four, five cents a word, and you can hire them all over the place. So what we're going to be doing, today, because we're not going to talk about proof editing. What we're going to be doing is the next step. We're going to be doing line editing. And line editing is a lot more important than proof editing. Uh, you got to have proof editing. It's got to be, that's the last step that you're going to do in your manuscript process. But the line editing is, I think, the most important because it's literally looking at sentence structures and, and information dissemination and why, why we're giving readers this piece of information here. Why do we construct sentences and paragraphs and, and all these different things? And, and we're going to get into a whole bunch of stuff. And we're going to get into some stuff with Marie. But remember, Marie only has you know, not anymore because it's one of her older pieces. She's grown as a writer, but these, this piece that we're going to look at is going to have some problems that she used to have. And we're going to talk about those, but we need other samples because other people make different mistakes. And we'll talk about those and we'll go through those. And that's the beautiful thing about critique groups is you have this, this diversity of people that all make different mistakes and you get to learn from all of them as you're going through and fixing them. The, the, the last type of editor is called a book doctor. 
or a content editor and they're expensive. Like, well, line editors are a little bit more expensive as well. You know, you're probably going to spend six thousand, eight thousand dollars on a really good line editor. Um, most of us, I mean, all of us pretty much need a line editor too, but a content editor is something different. They're they're expensive, 15, 20, 30 thousand dollars for a content editor. And what they're doing is they're going through and looking at character development and story arcs and plot holes and stuff like that. And yeah, you can hire a content editor, but I mean, in my opinion, if you're an actual artist, you're an actual writer creating stories. If you need a content editor, then you probably shouldn't be a writer. Like if, if you can't develop good characters, if you can't develop stories without massive plot holes, then, you know, spend a 30 grand to have somebody else basically tell you how to tell your story. I don't see that as art. <laughs> I see that as you just hired a different writer who's better than you to fix your story. And then you just put your name on it. But and that's just me. I'm a jaded you know, evil old man. So <laughs> take, take that with a grain of salt. Right. But, and also think that that's super important when you're in a writer's group as well to hear, hear that kind of feedback uh, as well. You know, all these different types of editing that we're talking about here, you know, if, if you're trying to help someone become a better writer or you're just in a writer's group, getting the, uh, getting those types of editing out there, you know, maybe you don't understand punctuation. Great. You need some help on that. Maybe you don't understand oh, this word choice, maybe it's not the right thing. Or maybe you get into character development. There's all types of different uh, critique groups and writers groups that just need to be involved in. Yes, you should spend the money to get someone professional in most cases. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be some where you don't, you know, like for instance, Drake, you know, he's, he's excellent. <laughs> stop it. Oh, stop. Well, and, and so I guess I should back up with that. Writers groups, you should be talking about content editing. You should be, you should be asking those questions. If you're in there and it's like, okay, I just read this, this chapter with this character. How does that character feel to you? Do, does, does that character, are you connected with this character? Do you want to follow this character? Is this a character that you actually think, you know, is a character you want to be inside of their head for a long experience, extended period of time. So I'm not talking about when I said content editors and, and you probably really shouldn't hire one because that's, they're doing your job for you. I'm not talking about writers groups you can learn this stuff you can learn how to develop better characters you can learn how to how to close your plot holes you can learn structure and and how to you know you can buy my book on dynamic story creation it's got a ton of stuff in it as far as you know structure and plot and everything like that so you can definitely learn this stuff what what i'm talking about is at the end of the day if you're going to drop 30 grand on somebody to come in and fix your characters i yeah do, do that on your own. Go to those writers groups, develop that skill, you know, okay, so you make crappy characters today, but spend the next year just really delving into what makes a good character and what is the job of a character and why do I need to, to follow these types of steps to use a character to, de to deliver those human elements to my audience. And so you can develop the skill. The reason why I wanted to go through all this is to bring us back to what we're actually doing in this segment today. And that's line editing. So we're going to go through a piece and we're going to really focus in on the line editing. And for the most part, that's what you're going to do in writer's groups. I'm going to share my screen for those of you watching us just on, aud uh, just on audio on the podcast itself. I will read every sentence and as we change it as well. And as we go through this, we will be reading the sentences over and over again that we're working on so that, you know, even with the podcast, I know you guys can't see us. You can go over to YouTube. The podcast is released. The video is released on uh, Just In Time Worlds on YouTube. You can just search for that and you'll find it. It's in a playlist called Releasing Your Inner Dragon. Starting with Mistress Blanche. So our main character, our protagonist is Lance and he is on top of a ladder looking into a vent. Mistress Blanche, he called down, back up to the door. There's something stuck in here and I don't know what exactly. All right, let's do paragraph by paragraph. Okay. So this is technically proof editing, mm -hmm. but one of the things that I'm really conscious of is sentence structure. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at a, a dialogue tag, so Mistress, Mistress Blanche, comma, close quote, he called down. So he called down is, a, is what's called a speech tag. In a speech tag, a speech tag is a part of one sentence. So that's why we have Mistress Blanche. So it goes open quote, Mistress Blanche, comma, close quote, he called down. She originally had a comma there at the end of down and then open quote, back up to the door. 
The problem is, is that Mistress Blanche, comma, close quote, he called down is a sentence. So it gets a comma inside of the dialogue quotes because it would normally get a period. But since it's a part of the sentence, we're going to put a comma there. Now, if it was an, a question or an exclamation, we would go ahead and put the, com- the question mark or the, or the exclamation point. But wow. he is lowercase because it's a part of the same sentence. And then he called down ends the sentence. So we actually put a period after down. And now we're starting a new sentence, which is the rest of the dialogue. So open quote, back up to the door, period. There is something stuck here, blah, 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 period, close quote. So these are two sentences in this paragraph. We do not comma splice it through there because the first part of it is a sentence. The second part of it is a sentence. And so that's why she's made this correction. And now she has the period, but the, he is still lower cased because it is a part of the same sentence as mistress Blanche. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to the second paragraph, this one is all actions. It says he watched her move up to the door and stop the apprentices who had finally arrived for their shift from entering. Lance took a deep breath and jerked his sword back. Sliding out of the vent came a cloth sack bearing something heavy enough to strain his wrist as he flicked it out into the room. There was a loud cracking as it crashed to the floor. Lance was close behind as he slid down the ladder, protecting his hands with his sleeves. As he landed, he heard a sinister hissing that made his blood run cold. You want, you want to take that opening sentence, Alan? Yeah, so I know, I know you something. do. <laughs> <laughs> so the big, the big thing in, the, in that opening sentence is uh, filtering. So mm-hmm. I look at the word he watched. So we're watching the main character watch something else. It really takes me as the reader out of the story because now I'm focused Am I supposed to be focused on the character or am I supposed to be focused on what he's actually seeing? So there's lots of ways to to look at that, to do it differently. Um, You know, various things could come up. You know, she moved to the front to the, you know, she or putting even putting in Blanche's name moved to the door. You don't have to say I'm looking at someone else doing something. We know you're looking at it because you're the, the point of view character here. Understanding filtering means understanding sentence uh, diagramming. You do, as a professional writer, if you're going to do this, you do have to know how to diagram sentences. And I know, I know, I know when I say that, you're like, but, but there's all those lines and jooks and jives and I, there's, it's so complicated. The cool thing is to be a professional adult writer, you only need to know how to diagram two things. If you know how to diagram two things, you can diagram every sentence to the level that you need to diagram it. You need to be able to pull out your subject and your action. That's it. It's third grade. Literally, that's what they teach in third grade. That's all you need to know. Can you pull out your subject, your action in every sentence? You can diagram it. That's good. You're done. So if we diagram the sentence as it was written, he watched her move up to the door. So the subject is he and the action is watched. Is that the cool part of the sentence? Is that what we want the reader to focus on? Do we want to focus on he watching? So by removing that filter, because that's what you're, the reason why I call it filtering is you're filtering the story through the narrator. You're making me watch the narrator while the narrator watches, smells, touches, does whatever, something else. I don't want that. I want to experience the story. We know that he, whoever he is, because uh, Lance, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. so we know Lance is the narrating character, which means everything that's seen, everything that's heard, everything that's smelled, everything that's tasted, everything that's experienced is experienced by Lance. We know this. We set it up in the beginning. He's the narrating character. We don't head hop because head hopping doesn't exist in any prose versions. So we know that if, if something is being seen, Lance is seeing it. So if we change that to she moved up to the door, now the subject becomes she or uh, Mr. Splunch, I'm assuming. We haven't mm-hmm. gotten there yet. And then the action is moved. So now we're more active. We're actually looking at the action as it's happening. We're not looking at Lance looking at the action. We're looking at Mistress Blanche doing the action. Filtering is really bad. It's, it's my number one pet peeve. So everyone who's been a student of mine knows. That's why I gave it to Alan because that's like the first thing I start bitching about is filtering because everyone does it because that's the way we talk. But we don't want that. We don't want that in there. 
The first sentence has now been edited to Mistress Blanche moved up to the door and stopped the apprentices who had finally arrived for their shift from entry. So the next sentence, Lance took a deep breath and jerked his sword back. I don't have any problems with that. The next sentence, uh, sliding out of the vent came a cloth sack bearing something heavy enough to strain his wrist as he flicked it out into the room. One of the things that I, I preach about all the time is how much pieces of information are you forcing mm. a reader to swallow in one sentence? So sentence structures to me, the way I like to teach it is at the end of a sentence, your, your reader swallows. They literally swallow that piece of information. So if you have a ton of information in one sentence, what happens is that they actually don't taste it all. They don't get the flavor of everything you're doing. So if we look at this sentence, sliding out, that's one piece of information. The event, that's another piece of information. The, there's a cloth sack. That is the third. It's bearing a heavy weight that is so heavy. So that's the fourth. It's heavy enough to strain his wrist. That's the fifth. He flicks it as the sixth out into the room. That's the seventh. There are seven pieces of information that we're forcing our reader to swallow. And it's, it's, it's just like any meal. Okay, so if, if I have if I have a seven course meal, I have steak and I have chocolate mousse and I have iced tea and I have coffee and I have vegetables and I have some fruit. If I just put all of that into a spoon and shove it into my mouth, I'm not going to enjoy it as much as if I just ate a piece of steak first and let that go down and then maybe a bite of you know fruit or vegetable and, and, and let me taste that. And so that's what you're doing when you have these long run on sentences. Mm. So what we want to do, especially in action. Now, sometimes you want run on sentences. So when I'm narrating and there's just stuff that's happening, that's not that important. Like I'm not going to write Drake walked in the kitchen, period. He picked up a pot, period. He walked to the sink, period. He filled the pot with water, period. He walked back to the stove, period. He put the stove, uh, the pot on the stove to heat, period. Because no, it, it's none of that matters. You know, if I'm if I'm doing this, maybe I need a pot of boiling water later in the scene. So I want to, you know, have it in there, but none of that, I'm not going to break that up. I'm just going to write Drake walked into the kitchen, comma, picked up a pot, comma, filled it with water, comma, and put it on the stove to heat, period. It's yeah. I'm, I'm forcing you to, to swallow a lot of stuff at the same time, but it all basically tastes the same and it's all flavorless. Yeah. So like she's already started breaking up, sliding out of the vent came a cloth sack, period. Boom. Swallow that reader. The weight, you, got, you need a subject in there. So the weight of it, um, the, the sack's weight strained his wrist, his wrist strained. That's probably what I would do because the wrist I think is the more important. His wrist strained under the heavy weight or something like that. Because again, it's about focus. What do we? So we could start with the weight, but now the weight becomes the subject, and whatever becomes, you know, the action. But we're in this part of it now. It's the wrist that's being, you know, affected by this thing. So let's make that the subject, and you know, let it be affected by something. So the wrist strained under the heavy weight, and so now we have a second sentence. Swallow that, reader. Doesn't that taste good? A strong flick of the sword um, sent sent it flying. I would actually come back to um, the, the bag or the sack uh, instead of it. So here's the thing. And here's the reason why I just, I, I, I edited the it. Pronouns point back to the last proper noun. So if we put it here, a strong flick of the sword sent it flying into the room. Technically, the last proper noun was the wrist. So technically, we're saying that he, he just flicked his wrist into the room as opposed to the sack. And so be careful with your pronouns. You know, he's, she's, it's, they all point back to the last proper noun. Because heavy weight is not, yeah, it's, it's not, not a point. noun. It's not a, yeah. So it would, it would literally point back to the wrist. So we want to be careful with that. You always, every time you write a pronoun, you should get in the habit of, of kind of just letting your eyes go back to, you know, just wander back up the, up the chain of information to see, okay, what is it? If I write it here, what is it going to be? If I write he here, what is he going to be? If she or whatever. So just, just get in the habit of kind of wandering back. But now let's look at this. Yeah. So now the sentence was. Sliding out of the vent came a cloth sack bearing something heavy enough to strain his wrist as he flicked it out into the room. Now the sentence is, or the sentences are, sliding out of the vent came a cloth sack. The wrist strained under the heavy weight. A strong flick of the sword sent the bag flying into the room. I'm not happy with all of this, but it's okay. Like I can cope. I would take out the first the and turn it to like he or his. Yeah, his wrist. Um, yeah. Definitely. Although you haven't 
you've used a lot of pronouns in this and we haven't ever actually labeled who he is. So I would probably, I'm looking. So Mr. Bashman at the door. Lance, there we go. Lance took a deep breath. Oh yeah, Lance took a deep breath. Right, so yeah. So our next sentence is, there was a loud cracking as it crashed to the floor. Lance was close behind as he slid down the ladder, protecting his hands with his sleeves. Again, this is just breakup. The first part of it, there was a loud clack as it crashed to the floor, has nothing to do with Lance was close behind as he slid down the ladder. They're separate pieces of information, so we definitely want to make them separate. And we can actually just separate them with a full stop. I have no idea why they were one sentence. Connor, do you want to? Sure. And, and the other thing in that, per, let's just focus on that first sentence. There was a loud crashing. So it's very telly. Whenever you see the word was, that is a, I don't want to, it's, it's not a hard and fast rule. It's not a hundred percent of the time you use the word was it's telly, but most of the time it's going to be telly. So it's, what does a loud cracking sound like? What does, a, what does that sound like to Lance? There was a loud cracking. It could be something like the, the, sword crash to the crash to the floor um it could be something else just you know bigger you know it, it clanked as it slid across the floor something like that um uh, depending on where the focus is on this but but stay away try to stay away from the word was as much as possible again sometimes it's okay to use you just have to be the artist and choose those moments wisely if i'm reading this and i go the you know, there was a loud cracking. I, my very first thing is what, what does that mean? What does that look like? What does that sound like? What does that feel like to have that occur? So just be cognizant of the word was when you're writing. The method that I teach for changing a tell to show is very simple. All you do is first you have to recognize that it's a tell. So there was a loud, that's a tell. I'm telling you that there was, I, you know, it's, it's, you can always tell because it's a, it's a math equation you know, it equals, there equals a loud crash. And so if we can do that, then we know we're telling. So to turn it into a show, we just ask a question. Now that question changes depending on the situation. So in this situation, it's a sound. So you ask the question, what does it sound like when this bag hits the floor? Whatever your answer is, and there's a billion ways to answer that question, whatever your answer is, is going to be a show always. Mm. You know, if it's a smell, what does it smell like for this? There was a awful odor in the room well the question is now is what does that awful odor smell like and that's going to be your show you don't always want to turn every show into a tell sometimes you just want a bright flash and that's fine sometimes the door just slowly closes behind jack that's fine but you do want to eliminate as many as you can marie actually rewrote this as the bag cracked as it crashed to the floor so this brings up another edit that i want to talk about and that's word choice. The beautiful thing about English is that English is one of the only languages that's created by stealing from every other language. You know, they created their language and we were like, oh, I like that. I'm going to take that. But I like this other thing, too. So I'm going to take that. And oh, look at this guy. He did this stuff. I'm going to take that, too. And so we just keep stealing and stealing and stealing. And so every single verb, especially that you'll, you'll get like 10, 12, 15, 20 verbs that mean the same thing, but all evoke a different emotion. So like she wrote the bag cracked as it crashed to the floor. And yes, cracked can be used for like the, the sound crack, but crack to me is always going to paint the picture of cracking. Like it actually cracks open. So now I'm going to ask, does the bag actually crack open? And if so, then yes. bags don't usually crack. They'd more split or tear because it's cloth, you know, is it cloth? I mean, that's, that's the other thing is I don't know. I mean, it says it's a cloth sack. So therefore to me, it would be a rip or a tear or, you know, something like that bursts open, you know, anything like that cracked paints a different picture than me. There's a box inside the bag. Okay. Well then you started something with wood. <laughs> I would go back there. The, the sound of wood cracking emanated from the bag as it struck the ground or something like that. Yes. Cause I think that's a great point. Cause it's the sound of what's inside the bag. That's, that's really in the important part here. And that's, that might be a piece of information that you as the writer know, but if it's not here written on the page, it's really hard for me as the reader to go, well, Oh, I didn't realize there was a box in the bag. The original sentence that she had is the bag cracked as it crashed to the floor. Now, Maria, Marie is the writer, so she sees it in her head. She, she sees that it's the, the box 
inside of the bag that's breaking as it hits the ground. You don't realize this, but you're writing two books at the same time. You're writing one book in your head and you're writing one book on paper. And the crazy thing about it is, is that you can't tell that there's two books to you. It's just one. So she wrote the bag cracked as it crashed to the floor because in her mind book, she knows that there's a box in it and she knows that that's what's cracking. The problem is, is that when you give the paper away, when you give the actual manuscript to somebody to critique it or read it or whatever, they don't get the part that's in your head. They only get the part that's on paper. So as a great example, the bag cracked as it crashed to the ground. We are not, we don't get the part in her head that there's a box in there. So we are going to read it as what's written. The bag cracked. So that's the physical bag actually cracking as it hits the floor. So she sees it different because she's writing two books, which is what made me prompt to, to talk about the sentence. And now we've got the sound of wood cracking emanated from the bag. And so now me as the reader goes, oh, something's inside the bag. And it made a, a, a wooden cracking sound. So now we're painting the picture that the reader is going to be able to see exactly what we see in our head. And, and you're not going to notice this. That's another reason why, again, at the beginning, as I started with, you've got to be in a writer's group because you're going to write the bag cracked as it crashed to the floor and you're going to be fine with it. You're going to read it 20 times. And every time the book in your head is going to go, but there's a box in the bag. What's in the box? We don't know. It's in a bag. So you're going to be constantly like, oh, no, that's fine. But then you're going to take it to your writer's group and they're going to be like, wait a minute. So the bag broke open. And you're like, no, what are you talking about? There's a box in the bag. And they're like, yeah, th but that's not written. I don't. I don't see that. And you're like, oh, right. The last sentence now in this paragraph is Lance was close behind as he slid down the ladder, protecting his hands with his sleeves. It was as he landed, he heard a sinister hissing that made his blood run cold, but that's faltering. So yep. as he landed, a sinister hissing made his blood run cold. The beginning of that is called an introductory clause as he landed. That is not a part of the sentence as far as like there's no he is not the subject and landed is not the the action. That's that's actually an introductory clause. So it has its own rules and regulations. The actual subject is uh, a sinister hissing and the action is made, you know, made his blood run cold if we want to include it all. You've, you've got to be aware of also introductory clauses and in, in different sentence structures and where we're doing everything. That's why he heard becomes this filter because we don't want the readers looking at him as he's listening to something or hearing something. We just want them to hear it. We want to let them. And, and that's the cool thing. You know, notice what she just did here. Taking out most filterings is literally deleting and you don't even have to do anything. You know, he heard a sinister hissing, bam, just cut out. He heard and you're done. And then she did take out the, the that as well. And that's fine. But, you know, a lot of times it's just, you literally just delete the filtering and you're gone. Okay. So moving on to the second paragraph. This is basically a descriptive paragraph. So down here in the south, they had a creature that was to the scorpion what the lion was to the cat. It grew to be almost a meter long. It had pincers capable of snapping a man's bones. Its poison, while no more virulent than that of the yellow-tailed scorpion, was delivered in such large quantity that a man stung by the creature would be dead before the candle could burn even half a nib. And it made a very distinctive hissing sound that ended in a soft whistle as it moved. The same sibilant threat coming from the smashed box near where the sack had fallen. I really like the, yeah, I really like the, you know, the visual that you give me in that very first sentence, a creature that was to the scorpion, what the lion was to the cat. I think that's super descriptive. So that that's beautiful lines, very, uh, very poetic line. I like that a lot. So I write in True Limited. And it's, it's not the smart thing to do. And I tell people this all the time. I've been doing it for 30 years. I planted my flag in it. I'm, I'm stuck with it. But one of the things that writing in true limited does is it actually limits you because, you know, it, it's a limited. So first person, free internet discourse, true limited are limited points of view, which means they're limited to the narrating character. First person is limited to I, you know, I'm telling a story, but I have a lot of knowledge, so I can do things. Free internet discourse is in third person, which is what this is. But the beautiful thing about third per or free internet discourse is you can be a little bit more omniscient when you need to be, and, and then also slip into the head and be limited. So this right here, this paragraph is a very omniscient, almost kind of, of piece of information. It's beautiful. It's beautifully written. 
Down here in the South, they had a creature that was to the scorpion what the lion was to the cat. Like it's this very beautiful like, like simile to paint a picture for the audience. But here's the thing. I can never write that line. I can't. That line cannot exist in my prose because I write in what's called true limited and true limited has no omniscient at all. So I can never step out of the story. I can never step out of my character's head. I can never move the camera away. I can never pick the camera up and do a wide shot, you know, hovering 50 foot in the air of like the whole scene or something like that because the character's not floating in the air. And so I'm limited immensely and this is a great example why i tell everybody don't follow me down the true limited path one of the one of the big reasons why i don't write in directly in limited limited and why i do do free and direct discourse is because i like giving prose descriptions of landscape and scenery i like giving wide angle character shots and i think i write them pretty well and you can't do that in limited not unless the character is can see it so if yep. the character's up on a cliff and he's looking out over a vista, sure, I do that all the time. Yep. But if 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 the character's in the jungle, surrounded by foliage and can see three feet in front of him, then that's literally yep. all I can describe. I can't describe anything else. I will say that there is one big risk with free and direct discourse that you have to watch for if you write in it. And that is starting with a pretty prose before you've made anybody care about your character. Right. Yep. No one cares how beautiful your landscape is until they care about the character. Yep. So sure. Start with a limited. <laughs> and, and you can do it deeper into the story. You know, yeah. you, you're you, you're buying loyalty mm. with with what you're doing. So if you're two, three, five chapters in, and you want to start off a chapter that's you know chapter six, chapter eight, chapter mm. whatever, with this massive vista for a paragraph or two, or even a page, if you've bought that loyalty from the readers, they're going to let you do it. They're yeah. going to be fine with it. Again, that's the difference. But yeah, you're right. As a limited writer, I never have to worry about, have I grounded my reader and my character before I start doing this description? Because literally the opening sentence, you're inside that character. And so I'm grounding you right now, right you know, immediately into this, into this perspective. Yeah. So this is a great example of that, of why I tell people, you really shouldn't follow me. You really should not write in true limited because you're never going to be able to do something like this. You're never going to be able to do, because this is kind of like an encyclopedia thing. It's like, <laughs> oh, let's open the book of creatures. And let's describe, you know, this, whatever this creature is, this, this scorpion type thing is because I can't, I can't open a book of encyclopedia because I'm in the character's head in the moment. And I can only see and feel and hear and touch what is right in front of me. Are we okay with that paragraph? Should we move on to? I actually did have one thing in that paragraph. Yep. Um, there was, it, it's repetition. The word it, it's there six times in those five mm. or those seven mm. different sentences here. You know, it starts with it grew. It had pincher, pincers, it's poison. Um, then we move down to the next second. It made a very distinctive sissing sound while it moved. So again, look for variety when you're writing mm. these types of things. You know, maybe it's the nap and the, the scorpion-like creature. There's so many different ways to describe it. Here's something that actually one of the other realm authors turned us on to, and I've been now preaching it because I use it. It's it's open at all times on my computer, at all times when I'm writing and we've all used the thoracist in the past and you should use a thesaurus and everything like that. But there's a website called one look O N E L O O K.com. If you go to one look.com and really the, the page is one look.com forward slash thesaurus. What one look is, is one look isn't a thesaurus. It's actually an AI that takes the word that you put in or the phrase because you can actually look up entire phrases in this thing and it will give you not just what a thesaurus gives you which is similes and and you know antonyms and all of those things it gives you colloquialisms it gives you just crazy just anything that might possibly be related to what you're saying and so you get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things not just a list of you know 10 12 18 words that mean the same thing because you get stuff that doesn't even mean like something a lot of it is just garbage like it's like why it's like you're looking up scorpion it's got hot dogs and it's like, why did you give me a hot dog? And, you know, I'm sure if you ask the AI, it'd be like, well, there was this one movie back in 1927 where they actually called a scorpion a hot dog. Like, it's crazy how much it, you know information it gives you. And so 
you know, I highly recommend that you keep one look open all the time. One look.com forward slash thesaurus. They don't pay me. I literally just love this website and so it good. is the best, the best for alternate words and other things to think about and everything. And I constantly use it. So I've just edited this paragraph now to be down here in the South. They had a creature that was to the scorpion, what the lion was to the cat. The napan grew to be almost a meter long. Pincers capable of snapping a man's bones waved overhead. The poison, while no more virulent than that of a yellow-tailed scorpion, was delivered in such large quantity that a man stung by the creature would be dead before the candle could burn even half a nib. And the scales made a very distinctive hissing sound that ended in a soft whistle as it moved. The same sibilant threat coming from the smashed box near where the sack had fallen. Before you had it and it made a very distinctive hissing sound. So I'm thinking it's coming out of its mouth. But in your book head, you know, your head book, you know, you know, it's coming from the scales. So by mm -hmm. taking out that ambiguous uh, pronoun and letting me know it's the scales, that changes everything I see about this creature. It's mm -hmm. now this this noise. It's like a cricket where the cricket makes noise with by rubbing its legs together. So now we have this much different picture that I'm seeing that you were seeing in your head, but I wasn't because it wasn't written because you had that it in there. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. I have I have improved <laughs> since I read yes. this. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Lance crouched and picked up the sword he had dropped down ahead of him. He held the weapon pointed low and cautiously approached. If it was a napan, it could track his movement through vibrations in the earth and strike with unnerving speed. If it was not, he cast the thought out and focused on the situation at hand. Just looking at that first sentence, I, I had I had a lot of trouble visualizing what he was doing, where he was in relation to the creature here. So Lance crouched, picked up a sword that he had dropped down ahead of him. So the sword, I don't know, it's it just it's the visual is confusing to me. I think we can. It's because without knowing it, what she's done is a flashback. Mm. She's. When, 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 the, when the action happened above, we didn't drop the sword. It didn't clang to the floor or anything like that. And now you're doing a flashback line only two paragraphs ago to let me know that he dropped the sword. We want our information to flow. We, we don't want, so it sounds crazy because, and this is a contradiction because we do want our readers to think. We want them to contemplate like, how is this going to happen? And, oh my God, how are they getting out of this and all this? What we do not want is we do not want them thinking about what they're seeing we do not want them thinking about how where things are in relation to each other that's the ambiguity that we want a clip from our writing yeah. and so when we get down here and we have this oh he picked up the sword that he that he threw down ahead of him but if you look up he didn't throw his sword down that information's not there and so that's information dissemination and now we need to you know that's where you go oh and i'm going to go back and either include that he flings the sword and the bag at the same time. And I'm going to describe the sword clanging to the ground and sliding across while the bag crashes to the ground or whatever, but I'm going to visualize it. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that my reader sees all of the action in the order that it happens. Because if you don't, then the reader, just like you, you're struggling. So well, wait a minute now, where's the, where's the sword in relation to the bag? And where's the, what, what, what? And I don't want to think about, I want, I don't want my readers thinking about that. I want them to think about what's in the box. What's in the box. Right. That's, that's important. Where's the sword in relation to the box? No, I don't want you thinking about that. Um, I'm going to give you that. And then you worry about what's in the box. Yeah. I think what you're doing up there is just adding that information back. Like in, in that line where Lance took a deep breath and jerked his sword back you know, at that moment, I, I still feel that he or felt that he had that sword in his hand, yeah. even though he was up on this ladder. Yep. Um, and so now, yeah, I think adding something that it, it his blade clang to the ground, that, that's great. I, I really like doing that because then it, it sets the visual for me a lot better. So what I did is in the first paragraph we edited, I just added a line saying his blade clanged down at the foot of the ladder. So now we know the sword is down there for him to pick up. I would actually comma that his blade clanged uh, down at the foot of the ladder comma lance close by and i take out the was because we don't need it now lance close yeah, behind close and you don't want to write as he slid down the ladder because now it's just lance close behind 
comma, protecting his hands with his sleeves. So now we can kind of combine those up because they're all kind of happen simultaneously. He drops his sword, slides down the ladder. We get to see that. We know where the sword is. It's right at the foot of the ladder. We know where he is because he lands at the foot of the ladder. We know the box is in the room somewhere. So now we're starting to paint that picture of where things are in relation to each other, you know, and it, and it still flows very good and, and very mm. natural through the scene. For those of you listening, the sentence in the paragraph above is now the sound of wood cracking emanated from the bag as it crashed to the floor. His blade clanged down at the foot of the ladder, Lance close behind, protecting his hands with his sleeves. As he landed, a sinister hissing made his blood run cold. Yep. So now we're crouching. We've picked up the sword that he dropped down ahead of him. He held the weapon pointed low and cautiously approached. If it was a napan, it could track his movements through vibrations in the earth and strike with unnerving speed. If it was not, he cast the thought out and focused on the situation at hand. The, the last part of this, this last sentence, if it was a napan, mm. that you can write in limited because technically the audience is going to go, oh, that's his inner, you know, he's thinking this. And mm -hmm. so that giving that information, you know, because what we're doing here is we need to let the audience know that vibrations it can sense and see and track this technically you could say is, is you go, Oh, well, that's an honest thing. It really isn't. I mean, it's close. You could say it's honest, but you could also easily uh, argue the fact that, well, I mean, he knows this stuff and he's thinking it. And so it's fine to be in a limited narration. It's not unlike that first paragraph that we talked about. That's absolutely, you know, an omniscient kind of more narration kind of thing. This, I wouldn't edit out of my stuff. I would write something exactly like that in a limited thing. The thing on, on this paragraph that, uh, that last sentence, um, it, if it was not, that is very, it's, it's like this foreboding. Oh, I hope it, it almost made me feel like, I hope it's a nap and please be a nap and because yep. I can deal with that. But if not, it's going to be this other big bad. So if that's what you were going for in this, then great, you nailed it. But if it's the opposite, if it's, oh boy, I hope it's not a nap and then it's just educating your reader on that. Yeah, no, it is. It is. I hope it is a nap and because if it's not, then my imagination fails me. <laughs> And it actually, it just reminded me on the first, the first word of the next paragraph is cautiously, yeah. but she also has cautiously in this paragraph. Yeah. True. So there's, there, I did want to talk about the cautiously and I forgot about it. L-Y adverbs are always a tell, mm. always. And they're always there to strengthen the word that, that proceed or that uh, follows it. So cautiously in this line, low and cautiously approached. Approached is a weak verb. So we're going to put cautiously to strengthen approached. There's a couple of ways that you could think about this. Could you, well, first of all, you can leave it. You don't want to cut every adverb. I use one every two pages or so. Um, I've been known to use two on the same page. Oh, how dare you? So you don't want to cut all of them, but adverbs are always weak. They're always weak writing. And the way, you know, the example that I always use is you could write Drake slowly walked across the room, or you could write dragging his feet. Drake dreaded what he would find on the other side of the room. And the second way is just so much more dynamic and so much more immersive and so much more terrifying than slowly walked across the room. I think we can leave this cautiously, but this one, this one needs to go. Well, absolutely. You don't want to have two of the same words no. in close proximity. But really, I, I, I don't want to give up on this. Is there something that we can do? He held his, his weapon low. You know, what is so? So if we can't get rid of the approach, I said there's two ways to do this. One is just look, is, is there a stronger word? How about that? You, that's what I was going to say. So the, the second way is exactly what I said earlier, is how do we get rid of a tell? We ask a question. So in this case, it is a, it's either an emotion or mm. it's a sight. So you did the sight. So the, the question that you then asked is, what does it look like to cautiously approach? And you wrote snuck forward. You could also write crept forward. You could write, you know, there's other words like that. So now we've taken, but that's the visual and that's fine if that's what we want. But we can also say, what does it emotionally feel like to cautiously approach something? Yeah. So you could write, you know, apprehension gripping his throat, you know, stuff like that. You know, we could, we could get into the emotions of it if we wanted mm. to. And so that, you know, and you could combine them. You know, his his throat seizing up, he crept forward. Like we can do both, <laughs> but all of them are better than cautiously approached, because cautiously approached is always a tell. Anytime you use, you know, and, and again, sometimes you want the door to just slowly close, and that's fine. 
but we want emotion. We want, we want showiness. We want to really push them into feeling the story, not just reading the story. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I, I say this all the time in our writers groups here is I learn something new every time we have any kind of critique group, any kind of you're looking at any piece. And I, right there is one of the things that me as a writer, I need to know this stuff, but I didn't. It's what does it feel like to cautiously approach? Because my immediate thing is it's always, what is it visually like? You know, I'm cautiously approaching. Ooh, I'm watching this person across the room, cautiously approach. What does it look like? But I love that you can throw emotion into that. So um, again, I learn something every day or every time we have these things. So thank you for that. Drew. that was awesome. You know, I only keep you around because you're good for my ego, right? There you go. <laughs> it's all about me too. <laughs> There, there, there was a sex joke there that I could have done that I just, I'm just going to skip right over. <laughs> he placed one foot before the other, like an acrobat on a balancing beam, careful to step only where he knew was safe. It was on his third step that the nap hand rushed him. It came at him with that weird whistling hiss, scuttling at great speed, its pincers gaping above its head and its tail quivering. A huge drop of poison glistened at the end of the stinger. So, oh yeah, I, again, I, I like the visual that you that you portray here, you know, like an acrobat on a balancing beam. I love that style of writing. The, again, a couple of telly things in here when he knew was safe. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what that means as, as a reader. I'm going, how do, how do I know it was safe? Was the floor clear? Was he far enough away from it? So just look for alternatives to, to show us that instead of just telling. Um, it was on his third step. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know if we necessarily need to know that it's, absolutely the third step if that's important to the story great if not you know the nap and rushed at him um just could be after a moment or something like that you know gaining his footing the nap and rushed at that moment causing him to be off balance there's a million ways to do this mm-hmm. kind of stuff so just be very cognizant of that for your readers i had the same problem the, the careful to step only where he knew was safe i i can't stand that line um, and it would definitely be something that has to be changed. The, the It was on his third step. So for me, one of the things that I'm always looking for as a writer is, is I really do think in the mindset of a roller coaster. So if, if I'm writing a scene like this, I'm going to actually want the reader to feel that everything's going to be okay before it's not. And that's how you show surprise. Instead of saying it was on his third step where it attacked him, that's kind of really just telling you this stuff. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this and I'm going to, you know, the careful to step only where it steps, you know, where he knew it was safe, that's gone. And I'm going to do something like um, he inched one foot forward. Then the next, the bag didn't move poked at it with his sword, the tip of his sword. Maybe he was wrong. Maybe it wasn't there. Boom. It's, it, it then comes out, you know, so there's this, I'm going to do this and it's not a jump scare. Like you're not, this isn't movie. So it's not yeah. like that, but, but you can write it in the same way. And so what you're doing is it's still that roller coaster. I'm taking you up and up and up. It's like, Oh, it's actually not getting, it's not as bad as you thought it was. It's going to be, no, it is. And so <laughs> it's, it's that's what I'm always looking for, even in a paragraph by paragraph basis, not just obviously in a scene by scene basis, we're doing that. But even in the moment, like, I, you know, if I'm doing something like this, I'm going to go, oh, look, it could be really bad, but it's not. It's fine. It's OK. Oh, it is bad. And and so I want that moment, that momentum going through there so that everything is is much more dramatic and much more exciting. The problem that I had with this paragraph was, you know, both the. <laughs> The, the, the careful step just doesn't give me enough visual. It doesn't give me enough emotion. It doesn't make me feel anything, but then also immediately just jumping into, and then it ran out and it came at him. And I'm like, ah, that's like, really, you missed an opportunity to, to kind of make me feel a little safer. And you're not going to trick me. No reader is going to go, oh, I couldn't believe it actually was one of these things. <laughs> like no one's doing that. And that's fine. <laughs> But it's still a little bit more enjoyable for the reader to kind of feel that, especially if you drag it out. And that's why one of the things I love about fragmented sentences, you don't don't use them all the time, but when you use them and use them really well, like one step before the other, then the next, he poked it, you know. So now you've got these little, these little fragmented sentences that make the reader, because again, just like I said earlier in this, that period makes me swallow. So if I go, then the other, that's not a sentence. But I'm going to swallow it because there's a period at the end and I'm going to taste it. I'm going to enjoy that flavor of that moment. 
And again, it is like cooking and, and serving food. I know it's a weird analogy, but that's what sentences are. And so I'm going to make you, I'm going to, I'm going to stretch it out a little bit. I'm going to make you feel like it, it, maybe I even bring some other characters into it. Maybe one of the, there's, maybe there's other tertiary characters, whatever they come over and they get, they actually get killed or you're whatever. I don't know. I'm just saying there's, there's things that I'm going to do for the drama side that I feel like you miss because, because what, what you fell into here was just giving facts. Like, here's okay. the stuff that's happening and, and all of this. And you're missing the fact that we're writing drama. And so drama is about, you know, the highs and the lows and the, the jokes and the jives and the making you think one thing and then giving you something else. And, and it, it, again, this is this is a paragraph that nobody's going to go, oh, my God, I can't believe it actually was. Wow, you really had me on that one. Yeah. Like no one's doing that. But it's still more enjoyable to read when you've taken that effort to make it a little bit more, a little bit less, a little bit more. Oh, and, you know, and it just it, it, it builds that. And when you do that in every scene and in everything that you're doing literally it just adds up and it just makes the read so much more enjoyable and that separates you know just good writing from really great writing i hope that everybody has enjoyed this podcast hopefully there'll be somebody out there brave enough to uh send your little baby in and let us uh kind of do this thing now one of the things i do want to say we, we in a writer's group we always say a thousand words and that's where i started with with this but now that we've gone through this at the devil that we're doing and really trying to explain things because in a writer's group you you know you get a lot of shorthand you hear the same edits from a lot of different people and so there's a lot of shorthand going i'm really taking the time i really want to expand these things out and and talk about them in greater detail so understand even if you send us a thousand words i mean we only went through maybe 200 words yep so, and that's I mean, look at, but look at all the information in 200 words that you can learn and grow as a writer hopefully you guys are out there and you're, you're gonna be brave enough to send us some stuff we won't name you by name or you know, put your Google map house locations so people can throw eggs at you because you were such a terrible. We're not going to do any of that. We're just here to, to grow and learn as writers and really try to, to do a better job. Yeah, this is, this has been a great session. I really, again, thank you, Drake. Thank you, Marie, for inviting me to this. Um, critiquing is, I, I love critiquing. It's just, it's a passion of mine. And again, like we said at the very beginning, it's, it's a passion because it not only helps other writers, it helps me. And I'm, I'm very selfish that way. So mm -hmm. thank you again. And it's been great having you, Connor. And we will see you soon for another episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon. Hi, guys. This is Marie from Releasing Your Inner Dragon. And I hope you're enjoying the podcast. If you're interested in more content on fantasy world building, head over to YouTube and look up Just In Time Worlds. I release tons of content there. If you'd like to check out my book, The Hidden Blade by Marie M. Mullaney, it is available as an ebook, audiobook, and print book on Amazon. Thanks for listening and see you soon. Hey guys, Drake here. Thank you so much for listening to Releasing Your Inner Dragon podcast. I hope you're getting a ton of information and maybe even some nuggets of gold that you can take into your own writing to help you on your journey of story creation. A couple things I want to throw at you. First of all, for the first time in years, I am opening myself up to being a private mentor again. If you would like for me to work with you to improve your writing right now, reach out to me. You can either go to my website, maxwellalexanderdrake.com, and send me a contact form, or just email me at author at maxadrake.com. Also, as many of you may know, I've been out of the novel game for quite a few years. I was the lead fiction writer for EverQuest Next from Sony. I've been in the movie and TV industry for a few years now, but I am excited to say I'm back into the novel game. I've actually been working on a novel for a little while now, and I'm going to start dropping it on Amazon's Vela. So if you're on that platform, look me up, Maxwell Alexander Drake. Thank you again for listening, and as always, keep writing.